Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of my going back follow-up series. This one is addressing the feedback that I received in response to my 12th theory and explanation video, Changing Rules. And as such, if you have not seen that video, then I don't imagine anything that I'll be talking about in this one will make much sense. So if you would like to go ahead and check that one out before continuing on with this one, then feel free to click this link right up here. But with that out of the way, let's dive in. Is this your first time in Tunisia? No, but it's been a while. So this first commenter that I wanted to address actually brings up a number of points that I wanted to go over, and I'm going to take those one at a time. If Ben moved the island before, why do you think he needed to blow up the orchid chamber again? I think the evidence is strong that he did move the island previously, after the purge, since it was to prevent Widmore from finding it. But if that's the case, the chamber would have already been blown up, unless the others went through the trouble of recreating it. So yeah, I'm glad to finally be addressing this in an actual video, because there have been a number of times that people have brought this up in response to me talking about the idea that Ben has moved the island before. If that had been the case, then wouldn't the chamber have already been blown up? Since that's the way Ben tries to access it this time, then surely that suggests that this is the first time he's accessing the chamber. Not to mention that the other way into the chamber that we see on screen is the well, and we know that by this time the well has been filled in. So what is definitely true is that if Ben moved the island previously, before we see him do it in 2004, he could not have done so by using the well or by accessing it through the orchid station, the way we see him do in the season 4 finale. But what I think a lot of people miss is that there is almost definitely another way to access that chamber, or at least there used to be. We see in the season 5 premiere that when Dharma is constructing the Orchid Station, Pierre Chang stops them from blasting any further or any closer to that wheeled chamber. <sighs> There's an open chamber about 20 meters in, behind the rock. There's something in there. And the only way to get to it is to lay charges here and here. Blast through and Under take a look. Under no circumstances. It is there that they construct their chamber adjacent to that pocket. What this tells me is that what we see in the donkey wheel chamber once Ben blasts through that wall... Dharma did not set any of that up. Not the lantern and not the ladder that we see. The really old wooden ladder. Now this ladder goes from the wheel chamber up into the tunnel that we see Ben come into from the orchid chamber. And again, based on what we see in the season 5 finale, it's fair to say that Dharma didn't make this tunnel leading to the chamber. And therefore didn't put the, the ladder in there. Considering this, I think that it's very unlikely that anyone would have installed this ladder to a tunnel that simply dead ends. We know that the donkey wheel was completed by the Egyptians based on the hieroglyphics that we see down there. And we also know that the Egyptians built a complex series of tunnels that spread over an unknown portion of the island. I am of the opinion that the Donkey Wheel Chamber is connected to that series of tunnels. And I do think that it is through these tunnels that Ben accessed the wheel the first time he would have moved the island. Of course, that then begs the question why he wouldn't have accessed it that way the time we see him access it. And I think there are a couple of possible answers to that. I think it may be extremely dangerous and time-consuming to navigate the tunnels to that depth. How deep is the station? Deep. And time was absolutely a critical factor with the freighter and mercenary situation. Whereas years earlier, the situation wasn't quite so urgent.
The other possibility for why Ben couldn't access the chamber via the tunnels in 2004 is one that I like slightly better, is that perhaps the path to the wheel through the tunnels had somehow been compromised in the years between Ben moving the island. As ancient as these tunnels are, it's certainly feasible that one or more of them could have collapsed, perhaps even when Ben last moved the island. This would then make blasting through the Orchid Station wall the only real option. One of the many things I find cool about this idea is how it recontextualizes the exchange in Widmore's bedroom between him and Ben. Ben's comment about Iraq and Widmore's reaction to it seems much more like Ben taunting Charles. It's his way of confirming without confessing that he's responsible for the death of Widmore's man. I see you've been getting more sun. Iraq is lovely this time of year. Now continuing on with Carbrock's comment, as a side note, in the bedroom scene, I think Widmore's quip about Ben getting some sun may have been a jab about him having moved the island again. I do agree with this. I also think that there's an element of Charles mocking Ben's leadership style in that comment. After replacing Charles, we know that Ben had his people move into the Dharma barracks and then working out of the Dharma stations. And so Ben's been kind of leading his people in a kind of corporate, indoors way, which is very different from how that group functioned prior to him becoming leader. And so I think that's part of the taunt that Charles is making. He's basically saying that now that Ben's been exiled, now he's more out and about and getting more sun. And then, of course, as I mentioned in this video, I think Ben's response about Iraq was Ben taunting Charles right back. But if Widmore was looking so hard for the island all of these years, why doesn't he use the lamppost station? He seems to know of the station's existence based on the fact that he sent Desmond there in Season 5. This brings me to Carbrock's next point. It may be worth considering that when Desmond visits Widmore, asking about Eloise's whereabouts, Widmore had probably already been visited by Jacob. Either Jacob gave Widmore specific instructions as to how to return, or alerted him to the function of the lamppost. So I actually have an entire video dedicated to establishing how unlikely I feel it was that Jacob actually visited Widmore. So I'm not really going to go into that here. But in case there's anybody watching this that hasn't seen that, I'll link it here and in the description. What this all essentially means is that the financial backing of all three sides, Hanzo, Widmore, and Linus, were all intimately intertwined. Because of this, and the aforementioned desire to avoid further bloodshed, I believe Ben successfully negotiated a new truce between all three sides. A truce that made killing each other and targeting their resources strictly off limits. So, much like Carbrock, um, this next commenter uh, brought up many points that I would also like to address one by one. The first one being, I just can't buy the Benjamin Linus going to some of these extents and simply not killing Charles because of some gentleman's agreement. So yeah, I think calling it a gentleman's agreement is a massive oversimplification. That said, I could have done a better job expanding on the potential consequences of violating this truce. Basically, I think it's a three-sided agreement in which each party is discouraged from acting against either of the other two, lest they incur the wrath of both opponents. So in essence, I think the three of them are checks against each other. If Ben were proven to have violated this truce, then both Widmore and Alvar's forces would converge against him. Likewise, if Widmore could have been shown to have broken this truce, then both Alvar and Ben's forces would retaliate against him.
And obviously, in theory, if Alvar were to have done something, then Ben and Widmore would both have responded against him. Essentially, the idea is that if one of them breaks the truce, it's all-out war. But it's whoever initially broke it that is certain to lose. Because the other two would join up against him before then battling it out amongst themselves. So the bottom line is, Ben has a real incentive not to be perceived as violating this agreement. It would not at all be in his best interest for Widmore to be able to prove that Ben has done this and thus get support and backing from Hanso's side in hunting Ben down and getting rid of him. Now with all that said, there is a sentiment behind what Pablo is saying here that I do see where he's coming from. And that is, if Ben is willing to discreetly go against this truce by having Saeed kill all of these associates of Widmore's, then why not just have him kill Charles? Or why not kill Charles himself in a way that it couldn't be outright proven that it was him? And aside from the fact that Charles being dead would then kind of remove Hanzo's incentive for not going after the island or Ben. I think there's a more personal reason, and that is, in my opinion, that Penny's not dead yet. Ben doesn't simply want Charles dead. He wants him to suffer the way he has made Ben suffer. The way I see it, that's the main reason that Ben never sends Saeed after Charles himself. And when it really comes down to it, I think that's the real reason that he doesn't simply kill Charles in that bedroom. As for the lamppost station, the facility that could lead Widmore back to the island, and indeed had been built by Alvar to lead him back to it once already, I think the agreement was to place a neutral party in charge of it as a gatekeeper of sorts. Eloise Hawking, the one former leader that was never banished from the island, and the one person that had up and down relationships with both of the exiled leaders, was the perfect choice. Also, I can't buy Charles not knowing and using the lamppost. Did he know Desmond would crash on the island and thus finance the sailing race and got him there? Why not simply follow his boat if he knew he would crash on the island? So this is once again something that I went into in my video specifically on Woodmore. So I'm not really going to go into this here, other than to say, yes, I do think he knew that Desmond was going to end up on the island and of the vital role he would play once he got there. I think the fact that he has Matthew Abaddon working with him, a man that we know has knowledge of the future years in advance. I think this definitely suggests that Widmore also has knowledge of the series of events that are going to play out, at least to some extent. But as for why Charles wouldn't simply follow Desmond to the island, since he knows he's going to end up there, I think a similar question you could ask is why did he send the freighter to the island without accompanying it? We can deduce that returning to the island is not Charles's immediate goal. But I think Widmore's up to is that he's using his knowledge of the future to make sure events happen in a specific order in order to achieve very specific results. But with Widmore posing such a threat to the island, and Ben wanting to protect it at all costs, he had no problem killing, manipulating, and or doing what's necessary before, don't you think that would include to kill that one threat, no matter if he's breaking that truce? So I do think that there are some important distinctions to be made here. The first of which is that when Widmore is being exiled, Ben is not yet that person that Pablo is describing here. In fact, that's actually what Widmore is throwing in Ben's face in that scene. But yes, approximately 12 years later, by the time 815 crashes on the island, Ben has changed. He indeed has no problem killing and manipulating people. But he's also changed in the sense that he now covets his power. And that's what I think he kills and manipulates in order to protect. Not the island, his power no matter how much he may tell himself otherwise. When he tries to make a fool out of Locke by showing everyone him failing to kill his father, he's not doing that for the sake of the island. He's doing it to protect his power. When he shoots Locke after believing that Jacob has spoken to him, 
that's not to protect the island, it's to protect his power. When he asks Mikhail to kill Bonnie and Greta, this act does not serve to save the island. When he actually does eventually kill Locke, it's not for the good of the island, it's for a chance to reclaim his power. My point is, virtually all, if not all, of Ben's horrible acts are self-serving, just as Charles's were before him. I definitely think that's part of Ben's arc, and kind of the arc of the island leaders in general, is that they have this pattern of becoming the monsters that they once overthrew. But getting back on point, I don't think Ben would have killed Widmore for the first decade or so of his reign, because I don't think that's the type of person Ben was yet. But after Ben is exiled, and he clearly is a person who has no problem killing people, I don't think he would feel the need to kill Widmore to protect the island, because at this point it's moved and Widmore doesn't have any obvious way of finding it anytime soon. And I also don't think that he feels like he needs to kill Widmore to protect his power at this stage. But as for the last part of what I just read out, now that I've also kind of elaborated on what the consequences of breaking this fragile truce would be, I think it's worth noting that while Ben absolutely would want to protect the island from Widmore, killing him and breaking this truce is far more likely to harm than to help, at least from Ben's perspective. If Ben kills Widmore, then nothing would stop Alvar from seeking out the island again, the way he did with the Dharma Initiative. And we know how that turned out the last time. Dharma caused at least one electromagnetic catastrophe, and as I would and have argued many times, they caused the fatal fertility issues. So again, from Ben's perspective, Dharma was really the greatest threat that the island ever faced. I really thought at that time that Ben and Widmore had some kind of Jacob and Man in Black don't kill each other curse on them, before it turned out to not be that case anymore. I still think it's because of some behind the scenes problems and changes we'll never know. I obviously can't speak with any real authority on what the original intentions may or may not have been, but I will say that me personally, I would not have liked the idea that there was some kind of curse on Ben and Widmore um, that was somehow stopping them from being physically capable of harming one another. This idea works for me in the case of the man in black because of his unique nature, or rather his unique state of existence. For me, it makes the idea that Jacob is able to kind of restrict his behavior in certain ways through his own harnessing of the island's energy, which the man in black is intimately connected to, for me that all works and makes sense in a way that I find compelling. Whereas I'm not sure how that could be applied in a way that I would appreciate to just normal human beings. You know, the idea that their physical actions and choices are being controlled in this way. I also feel like pointing out that if the writer's original intention had been that Ben meant he wasn't physically able to kill Widmore, then surely they wouldn't have written that line from Widmore in that same scene where he asks Ben if he's there to kill him. It would seem kind of silly to me that if Widmore knew Ben was physically incapable of killing him, why then would he even bother asking that? Regardless, we're not likely to ever know for sure what the writer's original intention was. But even if we were, would it really make much difference? Even if we were to find out that, yes, originally they intended that Ben was not physically capable of killing Charles. Us knowing that now doesn't really matter because we know that in the show as it exists now, Ben was physically capable of killing Widmore because we see him do it. So us finding out that the original intention had been different, I don't really see how that helps us understand the show as it exists now. 
the show in which Ben can physically kill Widmore and yet said, you know I can't do that. What I'm trying to do with these videos and by presenting my personal theories and interpretations of things is provide what I feel are reasonable, satisfying explanations that fit within the context of the show as it now exists. Yet, once Alex is killed and Ben declares that the rules of engagement have been changed, he runs right for the chamber. And when he leaves the island, he vows to start playing by Widmore's rules, where killing loved ones is treated as fair play. I'm here, Charles, to tell you that I'm going to kill your daughter. And once she's gone, once she's dead, then you'll understand how I feel. And you'll wish you hadn't changed the rules. Here seems like a good place to address part of a comment from Lethologica02, who says, The only thing I question is Ben's word choice changed the rules instead of broke the rules. They then go on to kind of explain why they feel broke the rules would have made more sense than changed the rules. And I did feel like this was something worth clarifying my perspective on. To say that someone changed the rules of the game is an expression that's often used in situations where someone has done something so different from the status quo that it's viewed as completely changing the way other people approach the same or similar situations. When responding to Lethologica 02, I cited an example from a word reference language form in which a poster by the username of Elwin T used a couple of great examples. They said, If there are two sides, say strikers and policemen, then one could say the strike was peaceful until a policeman was hit on the head by a brick thrown by a striker, and that changed the rules of the game. In that case, the rule of being peaceable, hitherto accepted by both sides, had been breached, and the police might start to deal more roughly with the strikers. Similarly, one might say Bill Gates was so successful with his marketing ploys that he changed the rules of the game, i.e. his competitors had to improve their marketing performance. So yeah, even in that police example, where the thrown brick would constitute a broken law or a broken rule, the expression changed the rules, as in changed the rules of the game, still makes perfect sense. So taking that and applying it to this situation, I think Ben describing the murder of his daughter and the way that that has now recontextualized his conflict with Widmore in his eyes, I think him describing that as Widmore changing the rules not only makes perfect sense, but I would argue actually makes more sense than if Ben had claimed that Widmore had broken some agreed-upon rule between them. Because I don't really think there's any evidence that that's really the case. And this last comment that I wanted to address is a more recent one from user JewelTom10630, who says, Can you give your thoughts about the rules that they talked about when Juliet was on trial in Season 3? The Sheriff Isabel says something like, the rules don't apply. And the other example is in the episode Inter 7-7, when Mikhail and Beatrice talk in Russian about some kind of rules that the others have, about not letting people in their territory. Maybe a similar situation to when Widmore snaps Cunningham's neck in the start of Season 5, when he's about to tell where their camp is. Hard to say if all the rules are connected, but I do think that these rules are related to the ones Ben and Widmore are following because they have all been part of the same group. I think the rules that Isabel refers to is simply the rule of law that this society has formed, in which it's agreed that killing one of their own is strictly against the rules. It's just not allowed or accepted. 
the reason she's saying that the rules don't apply is because that's what she's reading from Ben. And the reason Ben is saying the rules don't apply is because he gave Juliet a specific directive, which was to let Kate and Sawyer leave Hydra Island. And in order for Juliet to fulfill that request, it required her to kill Pickett. And so Ben, as the leader of this community, is stipulating that in this case, the rules don't apply. As for what Mikhail and Beatrice are talking about um, in Russian, I'm going to put the translation that's on Lostpedia on the screen now. I obviously don't speak Russian, but this translation on screen seems like a pretty literal translation. In my opinion, what's going on in this scene is simply that Beatrice is insisting that Mikhail kill her and himself in order to protect their society, to protect their community. She's expressing to Mikhail that they have a duty to protect their community, and that that duty dictates that he prevent them from being used to find the barracks. He's insisting there's another way. She's insisting that there isn't. And so, yeah, I don't think that there's any specific rule that says, okay, you have to kill yourselves if you're in some specific situation. Which means I also don't think there was a specific rule dictating that Widmore had to snap Cunningham's neck in order to protect the location of their camp. Do I think Widmore did this out of a really misguided attempt at keeping their camp safe? Yes, but I also feel like describing it that way um, makes it sound a little more selfless than I believe it was. But I definitely don't think that, again, there was any specific rule that was ever dictated to him saying people who might expose the location of the community need to be killed. Ultimately, I think the others are a small society, and I think with that comes a certain rule of law and a certain way of existing and coexisting. And I think things like exposing the location of the community to people that might be a threat to it or not killing other members of the community, I think these are pretty basic common sense rules for any society to have. And I don't think there's anything mysterious going on here. <laughs> hey guys, um, so the night before this is scheduled to release, I remembered that there was something in this video that I wanted to address but forgot to film. I didn't actually receive a comment about this, and that's kind of why it slipped through the cracks. But there's a part in the video where I talk about Ben having several trigger men off-island, and then I show a couple of what I feel are examples of that. Ben has several anonymous off-island trigger men in his employ. Wait a minute. It's right in your IV line. I kind of took for granted in this video that it was just kind of a given that these were Ben's men. I've believed that was the case for so long that it honestly didn't even register with me that maybe I shouldn't just state that as a fact. Ultimately, whether or not these specific individuals were working for Ben is not really relevant to the point I was making because I think most people would agree that we get enough of a sense of the network of people that Ben has that it's fair to conclude he has trigger men off-island, even if the ones I showed aren't them. Now that said, since I'm here talking about this, I will kind of go ahead and explain why I believe they were working for Ben. The only other real viable option for who they could have been working for is Widmore. And I just don't think that's as likely for a number of reasons. Yes, we do know that Widmore was keeping tabs on the Oceanic Six. But it is Ben that we are shown is desperately trying to get these people together so that he can get back to the island. 
The man that he tells Saeed is working for Widmore that's sitting outside of the Santa Rosa Mental Hospital watching Hurley. The way I see it, there's two possibilities here. The first is that that was Widmore's man, in which case Saeed killed him and now there isn't somebody watching Hurley and surely Saeed's good enough at what he does that he's not being tailed by someone working for Widmore. Not while he's committing murder and trying to protect Hurley, at least. The other option that I think is just as likely is that the man parked outside was actually working for Ben, and Ben just kind of set this whole thing up to bring Saeed back into the action. Like I said, I think both of these are equally likely, and it doesn't really matter what is actually the case. Because my point is, in either scenario, I don't find it at all likely that... Saeed was tracked to the safe house, or that there's any way that Widmore's people would know about Saeed's safe house. Whereas Ben, on the other hand, the person responsible for getting Saeed to break Hurley out and want to bring him to a safe house, Ben has worked with Saeed for a number of years, and it would make sense for him to know where Saeed would take Hurley. Continuing on from there, we know that Hurley and Saeed aren't confronted again until after Jack calls Ben and tells him that Hurley's dad has brought him Saeed. Hello? Ben. You'll never guess who just showed up at my door. Who? Saeed. And it is after that that the orderly shows up and tries to incapacitate Saeed again. And even Ben's reaction when he barges into the hospital room, I've always read that as him being like, oh crap, that didn't go the way I intended. And this scene in the hospital occurs the next morning after Ben has been told by Eloise that he only has 36 hours to get these people together. or God help us all. And that's why I think the orderly had Kate's address in his pocket. Because I think that with that shorter window, Ben couldn't just wait for his plan with the lawyer to work out. And he was just kind of desperately resorting to abducting the Oceanic Six. Of course, once the orderly is subdued, Ben just kind of rolls with it. And Jack finding the address in that man's pocket obviously sends him after her. So in a way, it still ended up serving to bring everyone together. Obviously, that doesn't last too long when Kate, you know, kind of pieces together that Ben's the one that's been sending the lawyer after her. And honestly, that was always the scene to me that, that I felt like was the reveal that Ben's been the one behind all of these people, you know, trying to abduct the Oceanic Six. I felt like that scene where she's like, it's him, like he's the one behind this, and then he admits it, I always took that as, yeah, that's that's what's been going on. And I do think that that makes the most sense. Ben is the one that is going to Eloise, trying to find the way back, and he's the one being told that he has to get all of them together in order to go back. I do think Widmore has certain motivations for why he would want the Oceanic Six to eventually end up back on the island, but I see no reason for him to take those measures. Nor like what I was saying about the safe house or the guy showing up at the hospital. In my opinion, there's no real evidence that he would have any way of knowing that's where these people were going to be. Also, when Ben meets Jill, he asks about Gabriel and Jeffrey and if they've checked in. And if the henchmen that we were seeing in early season five weren't working for him, then that little scene of him asking about these mysterious people that we therefore would never ever have seen, it seems strange and pointless. So yeah, I, I just think it makes more sense that, the, that they were working for Ben. But like I said at the start of all this, it ultimately doesn't matter in the context of what I was talking about in this video. But I thought I would address it. Now, since I am sitting down and recording again the night before this is going up, I did want to take the opportunity to address a comment I just got tonight in response to one of my posts promoting this video. 
And that comment is from the Ninja Ninja 815 who says, Well, we know polar bears ended up in Tunisia at the exit point, and they were being trained to use mechanisms in the cages at the hydro station. So I definitely think Dharma had some way to use it. I probably should have clarified their responding to the idea of the donkey wheel being used after the orchid was built, but before Ben had blown through that chamber. Possibly it was a part of the orchid station that had to be sealed off due to electromagnetic exposure, like the blocked off corridors in the swan. I can see Ben using some connecting underground tunnels that somehow lead to the wheel chamber, but that doesn't explain the bears. So yeah, I did want to take this opportunity to address that, especially since I was sitting down to record something else anyways, because this is something that I do have some thoughts on, and I do think this is probably a great video to share those thoughts. I have seen it suggested that Dharma was using polar bears to turn the wheel, and whether or not that was their intention, that would obviously move the island. And I genuinely don't think that that's the case. Again, as I said earlier, Pierre Chang was pretty adamant that they not blast any further towards the wheel. And I see no evidence that they ever did try and access that chamber. In fact, I see evidence of the opposite. The layout of the orchid station seems to indicate that they were experimenting with this energy by constructing their chamber adjacent to the pocket. This is the vault, constructed adjacent to a pocket of what we believe to be negatively charged exotic matter. Now, yes, we do know that Dharma was bringing polar bears from Hydra to the orchid station, and we know that at least one polar bear ended up in the Sahara Desert. But I absolutely do not think that they used it to turn the wheel. Frankly, I don't even know why they would want to do that. What I think actually happened here was that the polar bears were used as test subjects in the orchid chamber where they were exposed to that negatively charged exotic matter which Dharma knew would be really cold, and it was through the process of this experimentation with this pocket of electromagnetic energy that at least once a polar bear was shot out to the exit, which is the place in space that the orchid pocket is connected to. Again, the same pocket that Dharma's experimenting with in that chamber. So yeah, to sum that up, Yes, Dharma was bringing polar bears to the orchid. Yes, at least one ended up in the Sahara Desert. But no, I don't think that they were having them turn the wheel. Nor do I believe that Dharma ever accessed the wheel. As far as the mechanisms in the cages, I do think that's an interesting inference to make. But personally, I think that was just about testing the bear's intelligence and not about training them to turn the wheel. So now I'll get back to editing and hopefully have this video out on time. Anyways, I think that's everything that I've got for this video. If I continue to be on schedule, then next week we'll be going back to number 13, which will be a follow-up to my pulling the trigger video. And then the week after that, again, hopefully I'll be able to stay on schedule. But that's when I'm hoping to release my next theory and explanation video. If I end up falling behind schedule, I'll be sure to post something to let you guys know that. But regardless, if you haven't already, please do subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can be notified whenever a new video comes out. As always, I hope you guys come back for those future videos. Oh, you're still here. Hopefully that means you enjoyed this video. If so, please consider sticking around and being a constant for this channel by clicking right up here to subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell icon if you would like to be notified when more videos like this one arrive. In the meantime, feel free to check out previous content from this channel by clicking here or here. Oh no. Please subscribe.